This evening we're looking at uh, 2 Timothy, and actually this particular sermon could be preached from a number of texts throughout Scripture. We're going to uh, see what some of those actually in, um, in the context of the sermon. But one thing we need to understand is over against what is called perhaps the abundant life movement. Uh, the Lord has promised us an abundance of life, but not in the sense that these would tell us, uh, not in filling up, as it were, our coffers, filling up our bank accounts, uh, again, uh, having victory or success in absolutely everything we do for our own glory rather than for the Lord. So let me just begin by reading 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who were chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it, eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, again, you've already had a bit of a uh, review of what we were looking at last time, uh, what we consider to be one of the major errors of the uh, so-called church today, and I think we would say so-called church because the health and wealth movement doesn't really teach Christianity, at least in most cases. If you're seeking the Lord merely to be healed of whatever afflictions you may have, if you're seeking the Lord just to be rich, you're really not seeking the Lord at all in the way that he would have you to seek him for the right reasons. Our Lord Jesus invites those who are weary and heavy laden by their sin to come to him and to take his yoke upon them. Uh, he invites those who hunger and thirst after righteousness to come to him and to be satisfied. He doesn't want you to come to him under any pretense that he's going to fulfill your lusts or give you the things that he actually calls you to give up in order to follow after him. Now, those who promote this thinking aren't really promoting God's kingdom at all. They're promoting their own kingdom. And it certainly becomes quite clear when you compare their character and what it is they're calling you to do or what you ought to be seeking after to Christ. They are so unlike him, but much more like the Pharisees that Jesus condemned, with who, whom he said were inside or full of robbery and self indulgence. Self-indulgence is a sin, and yet that is what the health and wealth people are telling us to strive after. Now this evening I wanted us to consider another aspect of this particular movement that we want to distance ourselves from. And we might call it even a broader rubric under which uh, even health and wealth fits. And we would call it the abundant life movement certainly includes the health and wealth idea that we've just looked at. Another movement under the rubric is called the Word of Faith movement. Maybe you've heard of that, where the Lord has given to us, according to their teaching, the power 
to basically name or to say whatever it is we want, and God is going to give it to us. And I think the woman that I told you I heard on the radio a while ago that said, all power and authority has been given to me. Actually, it was on television. And that we have the power to call into existence those things that do not exist. In other words, we have that same divine power God has. Well, that's the Word of Faith movement. You say it, and you can have it. A seed faith, we already saw that. So you basically give a little. You plant a seed by giving it to a particular ministry, and the Lord blesses you with much. The full gospel movement, which believes in the continuance of uh, the charismatic gifts, and really these movements depend heavily on that, and the prosperity gospel. Uh, these are all different names for pretty much similar things that it has in view the idea God's will for you is health, God's view for you, or his, his will for you is, is wealth, and that he wants you to succeed in absolutely everything you do, regardless of what it is, even if it's just for your own glory. Now, in terms of, of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, and I hope some of you are familiar at least a bit with that book by this time, what they're saying is that the Christian life should be like living in Beulah land. We haven't gotten to that point in the, uh, the book yet, but that's where you should be all the time. A place of rest, a place with no struggles, a place with no trials or temptations, no fighting, no battles, nothing to interrupt perfect happiness and blessedness, which everyone can have, which you can have, if you just have enough faith. Again, overlooking the rest of, the, of what the Pilgrim's Progress might say and what the rest of the Bible might say, it's sort of like a tunnel vision. You can take just about any truth in Scripture, and if you take it out of its context and you just neglect everything else the Bible says on the subject, you can make the Bible say just about anything. But you've got to balance it with everything Scripture says to understand what the Lord is saying. This idea, again, of abundant living that they have, that God wants you to be happy in absolutely everything, no struggles, no fighting, no battles, just the opposite of something that Jonathan Edwards taught um, and we've looked at on a couple of occasions, the old fly in the ointment doctrine. No matter how good things get here, even during those best times of blessing, there's always going to be something, something in it to spoil it somewhat to remind you that full happiness, true happiness, is not for this world, but rather for that world which is to come. So you shouldn't expect your full happiness here. You should expect that that is reserved for heaven. Now, I've said that they might describe this as Beulah land, but what it really boils down to, I think, more is Vanity Fair. I think these uh, abundant living teachers believe that we should be living in Vanity Fair and should basically get all that we can from it because their teaching tends to be very worldly. Now tonight I want us to consider three things in this regard. Uh, what the abundant life movement is, uh, why they believe the Bible teaches it, and why we believe that the Bible doesn't teach this but rather teaches pretty much the opposite. The Christian life is not going to be one of, of ease, but rather a difficult life. We might say perhaps the most difficult life that a person could choose to live. Now, first of all, what does the Abundant Life Movement teach? Now, if you're looking for it on the web, you don't really have to go very far before you're going to find somebody who teaches this doctrine. And I found some great statements regarding it on Joel Osteen's website. I don't think he would mind my using this because this is put in, in the public domain. This is what he's teaching. This is what he wants us all to believe. Well, he has here as an article of faith. You can imagine, you know, when you, when you go to, you know, what, what do we believe? And you see, well, we believe in the Trinity and we believe, you know, that salvation is by grace through faith and so forth. And then you see in the articles of faith, we believe as children of God, we are overcomers and more than conquerors and God intends for each of us to experience the abundant life that he has in store for us. So this is one of the fundamental points of their doctrine, is that we should experience abundant life, which isn't so bad in and of itself if we understand what the Bible means by that. 
But when we understand what they mean by it, it's quite a bit different. So what does he mean by this? And what do the abundant living folks mean? You know, it's, it's interesting, but over the years, it seems like every one of these gurus, if I can put it this way, are trying to state it in the most shocking way that they possibly can, trying to outdo one another in, in, in their message, as it were, to show us just how blessed we are in the Lord. It wasn't, uh, well, maybe it has been a couple decades ago, time does get away, when Kenneth Copeland, who was one of these gurus, expressed it in this way. Dogs beget dogs, cats beget cats, and God begets gods. You are all little gods. Now, basically what he means by that is, is this name it, claim it thing, this idea that you have the power, because you're children of God, to do things that only God can do because you are little gods, which is absolute blasphemy. But it's the same thing that this woman had in mind when she says, we call into being those things which don't exist. Or another woman on the radio that I was listening to years ago who said, all power and authority has been given to me. And she was speaking of herself, although Jesus, when he said it, was referring to himself. And also, as far as calling into being those things that don't exist, that's something only God can do. But because you are little gods, you have God-like power. And you can command the world, and you can command your circumstances, and they will obey you. Well, having said that, we might look at Joel Osteen as being a little bit more subdued in his statements, but they're still, <laughs> they're still heretical. Now, here's a quote from his book entitled, and listen to the title, It's Your Time. Activate Your Faith. Achieve Your Dreams and increase in God's favor. Yeah, that's the title. You can imagine what's going to be said inside the book. Now, this is what he says on a few pages here, verses, or not verses, <laughs> pages 43 through 47. God never created us to be average. We're not supposed to drag around, barely making it, defeated and depressed. God created us to be the head and never the tail to be happy, healthy, and whole. The scripture says we have been made in the image of Almighty God. When God made you, he put a part of himself in you. You might say that you have the spiritual DNA of Almighty God. He's your heavenly father. You have some of his traits, some of his characteristics. In your genes right now are his favor, wisdom, strength, talent, and ability. Just as your natural DNA come from your, came from your parents, your spiritual DNA is from your Heavenly Father. The good news is that the spiritual always overrides the natural. God's DNA will override any negative DNA in your family line. You have the right gifts, the right talent, the right personality, the right height. You have the courage, the strength, the ability you need. But just as with the physical, some spiritual genes lie dormant, waiting to be activated. Every one of us has potential waiting to be released. You have more in you. Don't you dare sit around thinking, I've reached my limits, I've had a rough upbringing, and I've made a lot of mistakes. No, the creator of the universe has equipped you with everything you need. You have been programmed to be a victor and not a victim. If you'll stay in faith, no matter what has come against you at the right time, your seeds of greatness will activate and you will fulfill your God-given destiny. It's your time to believe. Now, I hope you see the problem with that. For one thing, it's, you know, it's, it's heretical, the idea that God puts some of himself in you we are not God, we are not little gods, we don't have God's DNA in us, we do have his Holy Spirit. And perhaps we could, if we we're going to be charitable, construe this in a way that we understand is consistent with the scripture. But what they mean by this is something quite a bit different than what the scripture says. We might call this the Burger King cult. Have it your way. 
God wants everything to go your way. And again, it has many adherents. Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, Fred Price, Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagen, Oral Roberts, Richard Roberts, uh, Joseph Prince, somebody I just came to see uh, recently, who through this doctrine of victory and abundant living grew a church from 150 to over 30,000 people. It's a very popular doctrine. Robert Schuller, by the way, was also one of these gurus. Now, why do they teach these things? Why do they believe these things? Well, they believe the Bible teaches it because of statements in the Bible like these. Jesus says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. The Lord says through Jeremiah, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not calamity to give you a future and a hope. Now, Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 31 through 33, do not worry then, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The psalmist writes in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night, and he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. And then Paul in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And we could add to that, he calls into existence those things which do not exist or all power and authority has been given to me and so forth, although I think most would stay away from those passages, understanding that those refer to the Lord. Now again, these passages are here, and they do mean something. And they are, of course, the promise to us of abundant living, but these use them as, or believe, there's so many blank checks to ask God for whatever it is you want. And God is bound to give it to you because he has promised you. God, in this view, I mean, basically becomes your servant and you become his master. He's like a one-armed bandit that you crank his arm a certain way and he, he pays off for you. Now they don't want to characterize him in this way, but I think that that's the way they look at him. That this is what God has promised, this is what he wants for you. As a matter of fact, the cross of Christ becomes uh, basically the means by which God is able to fulfill for us all these promises and making us whole, making us healthy, making us successful. Uh, children of God who experience nothing but victorious living. And again, the same thing applies to, the, to this as applies to the health and wealth. If you believe, you will experience success in everything that you do. But if you don't have enough faith, you won't. And so if you're not experiencing it, it's your fault, not God's. Now again, the one thing that seems to make this plausible is the fact that God has in fact promised certain things in Scripture, but not in the sense that they mean it. I'll tell you, you look at the churches that these guys pastor. I was looking at a video of Joel Olstein and, and the congregation. It's humongous. It's giant. It looks like a stadium. Why are there so many people who follow these gurus if they are in fact uh, wrong? Well, it's because a lot of people prefer that understanding, that spin on the promises, because it suits them. I don't believe the Holy Spirit would ever bear witness to, the, to what these men are saying. He can't, because it's wrong. This is the way they would prefer things to be. This is what they want to hear. Paul even warns, of course, in the last days, he was referring to his own days before the destruction of Jerusalem. But even in our day, human nature hasn't changed. Men want to have their ears tickled. They want to hear what they want to hear. There are very few people in any age who really want 
to hear the truth. Now, why do, uh, I asked the question, why do they believe these things? And I think that would be putting the most charitable spin that we can put on it, is that they really believe the Bible teaches these things. But I suspect, I'm not going to necessarily name names or point fingers, but I think perhaps you would agree with me, that what's really behind all of this is the big church. This kind of teaching attracts people. It builds big churches. It gives a very, um, uh, well, a very uh, large financial base to the church. It makes a person famous. He makes his mark in history. He gets his money. He gets his fame. Basically, it is a way by which a person might gain success in this world. You know, the interesting thing is that, that virtually all the people who follow them never gain the success. It's only the person who's teaching it that does, and yet they continue to do so because they basically are trapped in that, that particular, uh, as it were, truth that these things are all true. I've just got to overcome my doubts and have enough faith to receive it. It keeps you on the hook. And so you keep following it. You realize or you say you, 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 you believe it to be true and the failure is only with you and not with them. And so that's what keeps you going that direction. It's the same thing with the health and the wealth movement. But now what does the Lord tell us in his word about the Christian life? Why is it we should not believe what they are saying? Well, I believe, first of all, again, in a pictorial way, I believe Bunyan gets it right in his Pilgrim's Progress, that he paints the Christian life in the way that it should be painted. The Christian life is not one of the kind of abundant living that they're referring to, the health, the wealth, the name it, the claim it, the victory, the, you know, the success, uh, the worldly success that everyone is promising. But the Christian life is a dangerous, hard road a very straight path of the strictest morality, a path which is full of snares and pitfalls and many enemies who are trying to destroy us. As a matter of fact, it's the most difficult road that a person can choose, quite a bit different than the picture that is painted. As again, as I said before, if we were to take what they're teaching and put that or try to find that somewhere in in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, we would find it in Vanity Fair. That is what they're teaching, the very thing that Bunyan is warning us against. Now, how do we know that the Christian life is as Bunyan portrays it? How do we know it is not like those who proclaim this abundant living doctrine? Well, let's consider what Paul says to Timothy in our text this evening. He exhorts Timothy to be strong in God's grace was that so that he might be wealthy, healthy, and successful? No, but because the Christian life is difficult. Paul says the Christian life is like being in the military. It's living the life of a soldier. You are called to be a soldier, to fight in a war that is going on between two kingdoms, a battle that has to do with the well-being, the eternal destiny of your own soul as well as the eternal destiny of the souls of others. It is a warfare in which you have to fight against the very things that the abundant life people are appealing to, which are your lusts, and to put those things to death so that you can engage in the real warfare, which again is the battle to recover the souls that were lost when Adam sinned against the Lord. As a soldier, Paul says, you will suffer hardship and that you should be willing to do this, to dedicate yourself to winning this war. Jesus says if you're going to follow him, you have to pick up your cross. You have to die to yourself. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world, Jesus says, but loses his own soul? In other words, the pursuit of gaining the world is contrary to what the Lord calls you to be. Paul says to Timothy, you are not to entangle yourself in the affairs of everyday life but you are to seek to please the one who enlisted you as a soldier. He uses another analogy, that of an athlete, to, uh, as it were, conjure up the idea, or at least to bring back to Timothy's mind perhaps what he said also to the church at Corinth. 
And that is if you're going to, well, we're all running in a race, but run in such a way that you may win. Uh, you have to discipline yourself. You have to buffet your body, which is what Paul says he does to himself, so that he would not, after preaching to others, be cast away. Athletes have to discipline themselves very severely, very strictly, to win their particular competition. Paul says to Timothy, that's the kind of dedication you need in the Christian life. Paul points to his own example, how he suffered hardship, even to imprisonment, being treated as a criminal. But he was willing to endure these things for the sake of Christ's sheep, that they might be saved and have eternal glory. And then Paul goes on to say what must be true of every single believer if they are to enter into heaven, what must be true of you and me if we are to inherit eternal life. If you would live with the Lord, you must die with him. That's what Jesus meant when he said you have to pick up your cross. That's what Paul means when he says that we have been buried with Christ. When we were baptized into him by the Holy Spirit, we cease to live. And Christ now lives in us. If you would reign with him, you must endure. Endure what? The abundant life? No, all the difficulties that you're going to have to face as a believer in this world as you come against a whole array of spiritual enemies that are seeking to destroy you. If you would have the Lord confess you before the Father, you must be willing to confess him before men. And when you do that, you know it doesn't make you a popular person. You must be faithful to the Lord, or he, he says, in his faithfulness, cannot do anything but be faithful to condemn you if you are not faithful to him. Now realize, of course, the Lord will give you the grace to do that, and he will to every one of his children. But unfaithfulness is not an option for the Christian. Now, judging from what Paul says to Timothy, does that sound like the abundant life that these gurus are speaking of? And what about the myriad of other passages that tell us that the Christian life is going to be one of great difficulty, such as our meditation? Paul says to Timothy, now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. And out of them all, the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus says in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They persecuted the prophets? I thought they lived abundantly. Oh, okay. Jesus goes on to say in John 15, verses 18 through 19, if the world hates you, and the, the implication is, since the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Jesus says in John 16, these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. John says in 1 John 3.13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. And then Paul in Romans 8.35 and 36, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it is written for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Now, what do the health and wealth gurus do with passages like this? Does this look like abundant living, being hated by the world, uh, being considered as sheep to be slaughtered, suffering tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and sword? 
I have heard one of them speak of this. You will be hated because they'll be jealous of your prosperity. They'll be jealous of what you have. You have all this health, all this wealth. You have all that you want, all the success. And they'll look at you and they'll envy you and they will hate you for it. Well, that's not what the Lord is speaking of here, is it? No, they're going to hate you because you are like Jesus Christ, who by their standards, the standards of the health and wealth gurus or the abundant living gurus himself did not experience the abundant life. Jesus was poor. Jesus was hated. Jesus ended up being killed by his own people. I think we would say that's about as far as you can get from the abundant life that we're promised by health and wealth gurus again, but that's, again, what they say we should experience. Jesus tells us, on the other hand, if the world has hated me and treated me this way, that's the way they're going to treat you as well. So this is the abundant life that our Lord Jesus um, has promised to us. Now, we should ask this question. If this is really what the Christian life is all about, then who's actually going to make it to heaven? This sounds pretty hard. And if this is the Christian life, who really wants to live this kind of life? I mean, a life of hardship, a life of distress. Well, the answer is that that's the kind of life you want to live if you're a Christian here this evening. You know, not the health and wealth life that the abundant living people tell you. I hope that wasn't your impression coming in here this evening. That's what Jesus actually promises you. This is what he promises you, what we just looked at. But this is the kind of life that you will want to live if you are a believer. You actually do not or would not want it any other way. Jesus says this in John 10, verses 27 through 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Jesus calls to his sheep, and his sheep hear his voice, and they follow him. And his sheep follow him knowing what kind of life he's actually calling them to live. Jesus again told his disciples the very thing. You have to, uh, well, in, in a certain text, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, which means you must trust in me alone. And they followed him. You must be willing to die to yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. And they followed him. If you are his sheep, you will follow him. And the Lord will give you eternal life. And you will never perish. If you're a true believer, the Lord has changed your hearts. And he has given you the desire to live this kind of life, to live a godly life, even though it's in the middle of an ungodly world. It's the only kind of life that you can live. Your nature has changed. That's what you want. That's what you're inclined toward. You could never be happy giving in to the world's sins and making your home here. God won't let you be happy doing that because he's changed your nature. You will do what Christian does in Pilgrim's Progress. You will choose the hard life. You will choose rather to fight against temptation and sin than to give in to it. You will fight against the world and Satan rather than give in to them. You will move forward on the straight and narrow path, even though it is difficult. Now again, we won't do it perfectly. Even Christian's going to have his difficulties. It's going to get hard to walk on the road, so he's going to get off the road at certain points. But every time he does, he gets into trouble. And the Lord disciplines him and brings him back onto the road because the Lord will not let Christian fail. And he will not let you fail either if you are a Christian. So where is this abundant life that the Lord is promising us if, if it's going to be so tough all the time? If you're going to be hated and persecuted, well, the abundant life that he's speaking of has to do with what he has given to you to sustain you in the middle of a very difficult situation. He has given you promises. He has given to you spiritual uh, armor. He has given to you spiritual weapons in which to fight. He has given you his Holy Spirit in your heart. And his presence in your soul is what, uh, as it were, keeps you going the right way, keeps you watered. 
Paul says in Romans 14, verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, which is what, again, the abundant life people would tell us, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is more satisfying than anything that the world could possibly provide for us, whatever it is. Even if we gain the whole world, you see, it would not be as satisfying as having the Spirit of God in you. The Lord said on one occasion that he who believes in me from his innermost being will spring forth rivers of living water. This is that work of the Spirit that refreshes the soul and gives to you that joy and that peace and that happiness that is far more satisfying than these passing treasures of the world. That's abundant living, is having the fullness of the Holy Spirit will certainly make you much happier than anything else. As a matter of fact, with just that, the Apostle Paul was willing to do all that he did and to suffer all that he did. If we had time, we could read that catalog in 2 Corinthians where he talks about all the things he endured for the sake of Christ. And if he had a choice to undo all of that and to have the abundant life that these abundant life gurus are talking about, he would deny that to have the path of suffering because it was a far more blessed path than anything the world has to give. He was honoring the one who laid down his life for him. He considered it a privilege to suffer on his behalf. And he treasured the presence of the Holy Spirit in his heart that gave him the desire to do that. Now, the Lord has promised many other things as well, things that have to do with those promises that they take and they want to see those fulfilled in this world in, in just embracing the world and everything the world has so you can be, again, successful. Those promises really have to do with, with provision, certainly, but God's plans to grant to you blessing at the end of the road in, you might say, in the, uh, the church triumphant uh, once you've finished your battle here and the Lord takes you to be with him in glory. Certainly, God has plans to bless you but those blessings are mainly in the world which is to come and not in this world. But we've already seen that God has also promised that he will take care of your needs. If you put him first, put his kingdom first, die to yourself and follow after him, he will bless you. He will provide for you and he will give you success if what you're doing is meant to bring glory to him and meant to advance his kingdom and not your kingdom and your glory. If that is where our heart is at, then the Lord says that he will do abundantly beyond all that you can ask or think. But the things that you do have to be focused on his glory. God has never promised to bless a life that is dedicated <clears throat> to self-indulgence, to greed, to pride, or to hypocrisy. But he has promised to bless those who will give their lives to him for his glory and his honor. Now, as I've said, following Jesus Christ is difficult. It's the most difficult thing that you will ever do in your life. It's the most difficult thing that a person can do in this world. But it is also the most blessed of lives because the Lord has promised to satisfy you with his Holy Spirit, to take care of all your needs and to give you an eternity of blessing in his presence as well as victory in all your battles against your sin, against the flesh, against the enemy, against the world, against all these snares, he will deliver you. Not to mention the fact that when life is done, you'll get to spend eternity in the presence of the Lord, the beatific vision, which is something that is far beyond all we can possibly imagine. Now, again, the Christian life is a difficult life, but it's the only life that any true believer will choose to live because it is the only path that actually leads to heaven and to the one whom we love the most. So may the Lord help us to see that abundance of life is not embracing the world and gaining what the world has to give us because those things to the Christian mean less than nothing. At least they should. But rather, it is having what God has promised, spiritual blessings and provision and victory over the things 
we hate about this world and that we hate in ourselves and actually giving glory and honor to the Lord. May the Lord give us the grace to choose that life that is abundant life. May he give to us the ability to see just how precious that is and not to reduce it to what, again, these would reduce it to, nothing more than worldliness. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer, and let's ask that the Lord might um, help us apply what we've heard this evening uh, to his glory and to our good.